heart because I know there are things there that need to be bathed in prayer. And I'll ask you as I lead and to close and to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we give you all thanks and praise for you have made your home here in our midst and you have so graciously called us to be your people, called by your name, your children, by heir. By your word you called all things into being and you fixed them in place eternally. Father, we may not know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you know every step of our way and you have ordered them. You've revealed yourself to us through the law and the prophets and taught your people to live in love. And in your child Jesus, we've been loved as you would have us to love others. When he was crucified, you raised him to new life. And through your Holy Spirit, you brought us the message by which we are saved. And though we can't quite yet go where Christ is gone, you're preparing a new heaven and an earth where there will be no more death. There'll be no more sadness, no more mourning, no crying or pain. And there in that place, all who thirst will be generously satisfied from your spring of the water of life. Thank you for this time of worship, for each one who's gathered here in this place, and for those that are not with us today. We pray for them as well and ask you to be with them, comfort their hearts and their minds, help them, Father, to spend some quiet time with you this day. We ask all of these things and so much more that escapes our heart and minds. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, for he is the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Again, so good to see each one of you. I'll be reading this morning from Psalms 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he, for at his command they were created, and he established them for ever and ever, ever, excuse me, ever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of all earth and all nations, prince, princes of all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we'll have our hymn of prayer. Let's turn to number 573. You may remain seated as we sing, Pure in heart, O God. Number 573.
accept us back into the fold. We ask you, Father, to be with those people who are here this morning. Open their hearts, open their eyes to your word. And as we study it, may we receive benefit from it that might carry us the whole week through. We ask, Father, for those who have needs here today, whatever they might be, we ask you, Lord, to be with them and help them to know that you're standing right beside them, walking with them, caring for them, and dealing with what is going on in their life personally. Father, we pray for each one who is not here this morning, the needs that they might have as well. We pray that whether they're traveling, grant to them traveling mercy. If they're sick this morning, Father, we pray for your healing power and touch to be upon them. Bring them all back to be with us at our next appointed service time. Father, be with our church as a whole. Help us, Father, as we minister to this neighborhood. Help us to reach out to those around us, those that see our doors open each week. May we pray, Father, and touch them and lead them into this place that we might help them, Father, with their personal life with you. We ask you, Father, to be with our doctors, our nurses, as they care for the sick. What an important job that they have. For our firemen and our police officers as well, Father, we've just come through Police Week, National Police Week, where we remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in the laying down of their lives in the line of duty. We pray for their families and ask you to undergird them with support and lift them up and let them know, Father, how important their loved one's sacrifice was to others. Father, forgive us when we do fail you. Lead us in the week ahead. We pray also, Father, for those who've had natural disasters around the world and who have needs of many kinds, hunger, um, food, clothing, shelter, Lord. We just pray that you be with those groups and organizations that minister to them and provide those things. So much more, more, Father, we could pray for today. But, Lord, we just leave it in your hands and ask that thy will would be done. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
symbol that was given to us by Christ himself. It was to represent his body. He broke it, tortured, found killed him on that cross of Calvary for our salvation and for the salvation of all who would be Christ. In Christ's name we pray. We ask your blessing on this wine. The symbol also given to us by Christ Himself that was represented His blood that was to be shed on that cross of Calvary. And it was shed for our salvation and also the salvation of all who believe. Christ, He gave us, gave us this.
will be always with you. Let us stand for fellowship.
the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized men, criticized him, and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. And I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. The voice spoke from, excuse me, right then three men who had been sending, uh, sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and as we entered the man's house, he told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter, and he will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, and as he had come upon us at the beginning, then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray just before the message. Father God, we humble our hearts before you now as we have opened your word. We've read these scriptures. We pray, Father, now that you would guide us as we study, as you Father, would guide my lips as they speak these words that you have filled me with. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, and allow your word to go forth and forward unhindered. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. So how do you know a real Christian? How do you know a real Christian? As strange as it may seem, I hope that this church, over the years to come, can be one that attracts a lot of criticism causes a lot of controversy. I hope we'll be the kind of church that is frequently denounced by the outsiders as irreligious, scandalous, and to be avoided at all costs. I hope there are people out there saying that we have sold out to evil and are driven by demons. Now, I see the looks on some of your faces out there. Before you think I have a death wish for myself or for this dear church, let me explain. It's not that I like being hated, criticized, or abused, but it's that I have a passionate desire to see us being radically faithful to being followers of Christ. And if we're doing that, we're going to attract a lot of controversy and abuse from certain ones. Because you see, the Christ that we follow, he also was called blasphemous, irreligious, scandalous. He was demonized, and he was called a threat to public order and national security even. Those who will truly follow him can expect no less. This story is impossible to make any sense of unless you have at least a little understanding of Jewish religious history and Jewish religious customs. They're what the argument of the story we just read is over. Peter's accused of defying important religious customs and social customs, thereby putting the integrity of their religion at risk. And he has to defend himself. So let me try to briefly explain why these customs were so important to the Jewish people. In the history of Israel, going back to most ancient times, the Jews have always been living in a multicultural society where their religion and their culture were practiced alongside others. And frequently they had been under the thumb of some other nation. First Egypt, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia. Greece, Rome, and even Germany. They've had several long periods of exile from the land of Israel. They're only the only minority ethnic group in the world who have managed to maintain their culture and religion throughout all of that history. 
Every other similar group has been gradually assimilated into the dominant cultures that were around them until nothing distinctive about them remained. So there's a reason for that cultural survival. When the Jews went into exile in Babylon about 600 years before the time of Jesus, they knew that it was a major threat to their identity. So they set about putting in place some customs and social laws that would kind of separate them and mark them off from other people. Those customs fell into four areas, and you don't have to have much contact with the Jews even now to be aware of them, two and a half thousand years later. Can anybody think of what they are? Number one is the Sabbath and keeping very strict about what you can and can't do on a Saturday. Food laws, have you noticed they have separate butchers and chicken shops and a lot of your uh, foods that are marked, you know, kosher and pure. Circumcision is another one. And then marriage and social contact laws, especially about eating with others. Now, some or all of these things may seem a little strange to us in our culture, but they worked for them. They served as the boundary markers between one group of people and the Jews and everybody else. So any group that wants to survive has to protect their boundaries, the things that keep it distinctive. For the Jews, those boundary marking practices came deeply ingrained in their psyche. For a Jew, it became unimaginable to eat foods that were considered unclean, that were outside the law. You've all heard about Jewish attitudes toward pork or ham. It's not just pig meat. There's a whole range of them. And to a good Jew, the thought of eating them would not only be a threat to identity, but it would be nauseating to them. So if we go back to our story that Peter is telling, you can see why Peter was so resistant when he was told in a dream to eat unclean animals. The idea was, you know, abhorrent to him. He would have felt that the ground would open up and swallow him up. Or a lightning bolt might strike him down or something like that. How many of you remember... If you were walking down the sidewalk, maybe with a group of friends when you were young and going to school or something, and somebody would say, step on a crack, break your mother's back. Now, you knew that was highly unlikely, but just in case, you did some crazy dance moves and some odd steps to avoid stepping on all those cracks, didn't you? You could just imagine your mother at home going, oh, my back. So this is kind of what Peter's thinking. If I break these Jewish laws and customs, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm just going to be swallowed up right here in the earth. So in Peter's case, the voice of God tells him about the food. And it says, if God says it's clean, who are you to say otherwise? Don't call it profane if God says it's good. So even with instruction from God, though, did you notice it took how many times? Three. It took three times before Peter would agree to eat. So then the next day, he discovers that God was preparing him for something. Isn't that usually the way it is? We have a big revelation from God if he's preparing us for something. The next day, he receives an invitation to dinner in the home of Gentiles, who the custom said he couldn't eat with. They wanted to hear about God from Peter. So having been prepared in the dream, he didn't have the conscience battle now, and so he went to dinner with the Gentiles. But when he got back to the church council in Jerusalem, guess what? Well, they had a problem with it. And Peter was called to account for his outrageous and scandalous behavior. People thought he had sold out. They thought he had abandoned the faith. They thought he behaved in a grossly offensive and irreligious manner. And Peter had to explain that God is changing the rules. God is busy changing the rules. The times are changing, as the old saying goes. So you say, all right, Pastor, that's good. That's thousands of year old story. What does this have to do with us today? Well, I'm glad you asked. One way of describing the history of the church is one long struggle over the boundary markers. Who's in? Who's out? Pretty much every major dispute in the story of the church, and there's been some doozies, has been about whether certain beliefs or certain behaviors meant you were unchristian or not. Some of the earliest of those fights in the Christian church happened in the New Testament and while it was still being written. And you can see some of them being fought out in the Bible. Can you think of what some of the ones are you know, mentally to yourself? Keeping Jewish law, circumcision, relationship between whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor, private property laws, Jesus as a human or just a spirit, 
Others were fought out in the major church councils of the first few centuries, like the importance of believing the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Those were argued over endlessly. The Protestant Reformation was a major argument and spat over who was in and who was out and how you came to get in or out of the church. In America, there was a long-running war about whether a slave could be accepted in the church. Back when I was in the serving the church in the Southern Baptist Convention, we were in the Strawberry Association, and we had a lot of churches. The majority of them were in Bedford. I think we had one in Franklin and one in Bogota. But there's a church called, I don't know if you've ever been there or heard of it, called Suck Spring Baptist Church in Bedford County. And they have a uh, they have a balcony in the back of the church. There is no way to get to the balcony from inside the church. There's a separate door outside that you go in, and it immediately goes up steps into the church and into the balcony. That's where the slaves sat. Because when they finally agreed to let the slaves in the church, then they thought, well, we got to make them sit somewhere else. They can't just sit with us. And in other churches I've been to down in South Carolina, they have pews just like we have, but they will have some of them boxed off. And those areas you had to go through a little swinging little door, like a butler door, I guess I call it, and then you were in your little box, and that's where they made the slaves sit. And then they also made the men and the women sit separate for a long time. And then they made the rich and the wealthy. Was the rich and the wealthy made you sit separate from the poor. So it, on and on we go. So you see where all these church spats go over. They, they thought it, you know, was a bad thing for the slaves to be sitting with the free people. But then eventually they recognized it as the evil that it was. And there was an argument over whether even a slave owner could be accepted into the church. And the last 30 years have been even more fights over what the boundary markers are. Over what sort of person do we say is a Christian and is not a Christian. What are some of the ones we can think of? I know a few that have snuck up on people over the years. Smoking, drinking, wearing makeup. We used to have a pastor say, I'm not against makeup. He said, I think a fresh coat of paint makes any barn look good. I don't think that was a wise thing to say from the pulpit. Women wearing pants. I remember when I was growing up, that was a big issue. We went to a church where they didn't want women wearing pants. You had to wear a skirt or a dress to church. Being gay. Swearing. Dancing was even a big thing. There was always a, a talk amongst my grandparents where they had to sneak and go to dances back in the 30s, when they, 20s and 30s when they were dating. They had to sneak and go to dances because mama wouldn't have approved. The church wouldn't have approved. Even going to the movies at one point when motion picture shows came out, there were churches that were against the youth going to go see movies. Even women serving in the church. We, did you know that the disciples, I hope that you know this, but I'm going to point it out anyway. The Disciples of Christ is the most mainline Protestant denomination that had their first African American uh, as a general minister and president and the first to have a woman as general minister and president. So we were at the forefront of a lot of that. And a lot of churches, there are even some still today, folks, that will not let women do anything in the church service. You're just not allowed. They've interpreted scripture wrongly that way, but that's the way it is. So let me put it to you this way. At each of these disputes that I just named, we've broken down another barrier as we've come to them. And we have, in fact, become more Christian because of that. And we need to be constantly vigilant that we're not putting up new barriers to people being accepted into God's family. Because God hasn't put them there. We as man have put them there. Let's be clear about that. And we need to be constantly listening to the voices of anybody who feels alienated and doesn't feel like they can come into a church because they feel excluded. The Christ that we've chosen to follow was more than anything else all about inclusive. His message was that anybody can be close to God and accepted by God and that those who had been most excluded by social and religious customs back in the day were most welcome in his company. If you just go back and read the four Gospels, you'll find that the things that Jesus was repeatedly in trouble over and that he was eventually executed because of were mainly about this. Either he was associating with and accepting people that they had previously excluded, or he was allowing people to behave in ways that the religious thought that 
would have previously kicked him out of the community. And his practice of accepting people and allowing acceptance doesn't seem to have been as conditional as we often think. Certainly Jesus was somebody who advocated repentance, change, turning from sin, and growth. But he doesn't ever seem to have made it a condition of acceptance just based on who the person was. Jesus is accused of partying with prostitutes, sinners, not ex-prostitutes, not ex-sinners, and in one particular argument with some religious leaders who were specialists in deciding who was to be kept out, he said that the prostitutes and the tax collectors were going into the kingdom of God before them. How do you think that went over? Probably not very well. The Gospels contain story after story of Jesus welcoming and accepting people who had been pushed aside by the church and society too. Prostitutes, tax collectors, publicans, the blind, the disabled, the lepers, the mentally ill, the foreigners. Again and again, every boundary, Jesus pushed it back and broke it down. Were women excluded from participating in religious life? Jesus welcomed them into his circle. Were those of other races considered second rate about chosen people? Jesus goes to them to preach to them about acceptance by God. Were children considered nobodies in the community? Jesus welcomed them and said that the kingdom of God belonged to them and those who were like them. If you want to find words of condemnation from Jesus, words where he says something that someone is putting themselves beyond God acceptance, you can find them. But who are they for? The religious, exclusive, and oppressive, and the economically exclusive and expressive. Now, if all those laws and customs function as boundary markers and they were about maintaining the identity of a community, you can see why Jesus was unpopular, right? You can also ask the question, what is going to distinguish the community? If we follow Jesus in breaking down all of those barriers, then how are we going to know who's Christian and who isn't? Who's part of God's family and who isn't? How do I spot the real Christian? So, they're hot potatoes issues, really. And I had a youth leader once who told me when he was a teenager, he had taken a Christian girl out in the day, so many Christians still thought one of the movies was a sin. We talked about that a minute ago. And when he arrived at her place to pick her up, she and her father were both in tears and having a terrible argument about whether she could go to a movie or not. And in desperation, the father said, but if we Christians start going to the movies, there's going to be no difference in us and the world. Now, it may sound crazy to us today, but it was a clear boundary marker to that father. And he needed to know where the markers were. If they're all gone, who are we? And the same worry, fear about many around Jesus as he dismantled all those boundaries. So we say, what distinguishes us when we're male and female and white and black and rich and poor, celebrate, celibate and promiscuous, perfumed and smelly, smart and dumb, old and young, Beautiful and disfigured, temperate and beer swelling, homosexual and heterosexual, sane and psychotic, serious and joyful, distressed, financially successful, welfare dependent, clean living and drug addicted, those who are carnivorous and those who are vegetarians, those who are dressed to the nines when they come to church and those who are disheveled then who are we if we can't have all of these boundaries? How will we distinguish from those who haven't responded to the grace of God's gift? Well, Jesus gives one answer, and one answer only. He says, listen closely, love one another. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. End quote. That's it. That's in the Bible, folks. There's no other distinguishing feature that is not directly related to that. Yes, we are a people of justice. Yes, we are a people of mercy. Yes, we are a people of compassion. All that is in love, in action. That's how you love others. Love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples. That's the boundary marker. I know this was a long sermon to get to that, and you might have been expecting something crazy, just fantastic at the ending, 
But that's it. We love one another. That's what Christ said. Any other boundary marker that we put up, any other thing that we put up in the way of others coming into a church, coming into the family of God, that's not directly related to that, is not Christian. And so Peter said when he reported back to the church council of Jerusalem, he had to say this, I know these people were supposed to be outsiders based on all that we had ever been taught and all that we had ever known. But God was clearly at work among them. And if God accepts them and they accept God, then I reckon the best of us and the rest of us better get out of the way and let God do his work. There's no other distinction. Jesus said, by their love, by their fruit, you will know them. The choir and you guys helped just saying, they'll know we're Christians by our love. If the fruit is love, then the living response to the Spirit of God is that as well. Because God is love. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, we know that as mankind, we've put up tons of social barriers in place. Barriers that, as we just talked about, have been in place over the years, and then we suddenly came to realize that's not a reason to keep someone from coming into God's family. That's, not a, that's a man-made reason. So, Father, any barriers that we put in place that prevent others from coming to know the true and living God, we are truly sorry. We recognize that in your word we are taught that you loved and you accepted all people and you grew and equipped them to be your disciples. You forgave them, you loved them, and you welcomed them. That's what we should do. Help us each to have that same loving, accepting attitude that you perfectly exemplified. As we close our service today, God, we ask that your presence be with that one who has a need of any kind in their life today. Emotional, physical, financial, family, job-related, whatever it is, help them to feel your closeness, your love, and help them to know that you're working in their life. For that one who may need to make a decision this morning about their faith life, we pray that you give them the strength and the courage to come and share that decision with us, their friends and family. We might rejoice with them and support them in their walk with you. And this and so many other things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is number 673. We're going to sing down by the riverside. Number 673. Stand as you're able. And sing again. <laughs>
Christ has done for you. If you need me again for any reason this week, give me a call. Hope you have a blessed week this week. Uh, invite somebody to church next week. Let them then look around, see who's not here also, and give them a call this week or send a card, whatever your thing is, and let them know that they will truly miss. But we're so thankful, again, for your presence today. May God follow you throughout the week. Let's respond with our commissioning statement. I'll give our benediction. We'll sing our four blessings together before we dismiss. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. May God be your beginning and your end. May Christ Jesus make his home among you. And may the Holy Spirit give you a vision of the all-embracing love of God. Amen.